Hey everyone, so our third part of this series, we did viruses, we did bacteria, and now we're doing a couple parasites and a couple funguses. This is a shorter lecture. I'm just going to hit a few of each of those, just some common ones, just so that we've seen them before. Uh, and so we're going to start with a, just a couple of the funguses that we'd typically encounter uh, that cause disease in people. So one of those is pneumocystis. So that's caused by the uh, species of pneumocystis, so that would be the genus. Uh, but there's subspecies of funguses called pneumocystis, uh, and they cause a pneumonia. So they infect the lungs. We call it PCP, not the drug, but pneumocystic pneumonia. And it's really, really common. So if you have an immunocompromised patient, so someone with end-stage HIV infection, a uh, cancer patient, you name it, if they're immunocompromised, the most common cause of pneumonia in them is pneumocystis because it generally just is in the environment. Uh, we usually fight it off. It's not usually a big deal. But if you're immunocompromised, you just don't have those tools to fight them off. Now, another common fungal infection we have to talk about is Candida albicans. So this would be a yeast infection. So uh, typically we think of yeast infections as affecting the vaginal canal, but they can infect really anything. Uh, we have yeast all over our bodies all the time, and it's perfectly fine. Uh, it's just if something changes and allows the yeast to grow out of control for a little while, that can become a really big problem, especially for little kids. You can see a lot of di diaper rashes. Um, you can get this this white discharge that's going on, a lot of itching. Uh, it turns kind of white, and so you can see here's like a, an oral version on someone's tongue. We would call that an oral thrush, which is a really common symptom of uh, end-stage HIV infection or AIDS. You get that oral thrush going on, and that just tells you, hey, their immune system just isn't dealing with this infection very well. Hence, immune dysfunction can be a cause of it. Uh, but a lot of times it can just be like, oh, you changed your diet, uh, your hormones have switched up, something in your life has changed, uh, and that can just exacerbate these kinds of infections. But it's really common. Uh, you can treat it with antifungals. It's, you know, it's just a yeast infection. Now, another one that you may have heard of, especially uh, like in elementary school, is ringworm. Uh, so that's caused by uh, two different kinds of species of fungus. So it is a, fun a fungus. Uh, you get this typical ring structure. That's why it's called ringworm. It is not a worm. That's why I purposely talked about it here. Uh, it is only cutaneous. So it's just in your epidermis, you're getting this infection. There are two species that are, it's caused by. So if you have a person-to-person -person transmission, that's normally caused by trichophyton rubrum. Rubrum meaning red. Uh, so that's between people. Now, if you get it from a cat or a dog... That's called microsporum canis, canis meaning dog. And so it just kind of depends. You're going to get the same kind of red ring. You can get it literally anywhere on your body, but normally people think about it on your hair or your scalp line. But it's pretty treatable. It's just cutaneous. It's not usually an issue. So that's tinea corporis or ringworm. Now let's go on to parasites. So I'm separating parasites. I understand a lot of people get confused where I'll say a virus is a parasitic organism or a fungus is a parasitic organism. Usually when we say parasites, we're referring to very large eukaryotic organisms that are infecting humans or animals. And so that's what we're talking about here. So one really common one would be toxoplasmosis. So that's Toxoplasma gondii. It's a single-celled parasite. So these are all eukaryotes. Uh, it can make you really, really sick, but it's not usually the issue. Uh, the issue is mainly with congenital infections. So this is the one where they'll say uh, pregnant women shouldn't garden uh, or pregnant women shouldn't do yard work because cats just kind of poop everywhere. This happens at our house all the time. We don't have cats, but there's like a ton of neighborhood cats and they really like pooping in our front yard for some reason. And what happens is toxoplasma will infect the cat uh, because the cat was eating mice that also have the infection. And so that infects the cat and that's the cycle. And then what can happen is it can have switch hosts and can move on to infect humans. And if you pass it on to the baby when you're pregnant, it can kill your baby. Now, it was in the news probably 10, 15 years ago because there were some dubious studies that tried to associate toxoplasma infections with psychological problems. And so if you do a little bit of digging, or actually not much digging at all, uh, you can find some evidence of this. Um, if you actually go to the original studies, it's a little dicey as far as their p-values and like how significant actually was the data, uh, because a lot of times they were saying, okay, well, they just surveyed a bunch of people and saw if they had toxoplasma antibodies, which means they were exposed to it at some point, but that could have been any time previous. So they could have been exposed as like a two-year-old and now they're a 45-year-old, but they're still toxo positive. But there was some interesting data that associated toxoplasma antibodies and potential toxoplasma infections with crime rates. 
uh, the rate of being jailed, other psychological issues, things like that. And so uh, it was an interesting study in maybe there's some deeper cause for why people uh, get more speeding tickets. But if you actually dig into the data, it wasn't super convincing, but some people got really into it. Now, moving on to another infection. So uh, malaria, so that's plasmodium species. Uh, there's plasmodium falciparum is the most common one that people talk about. Uh, there's also plasmodium malariae. And so plasmodium, those are causing malaria. They're mosquito-borne, so they're vector-borne. So if you have some kind of vector, that means uh, a vector is just something that's transmitting something else. And so we talk about viral vectors, so that could be a virus that's delivering some kind of DNA. Uh, you can have a mosquito vector. You could have a fly vector. You could have an inanimate vector. We usually call those fomites. But basically, you get this malaria parasite in your body, and it attacks your red blood cells, and it goes inside of them and grows inside of them, and then they explode. And so by killing a bunch of erythrocytes, you become anemic. Now, the goal of the malaria is to have enough of the gametocytes in your bloodstream so that when another mosquito bites you, it sucks up some of that and then can live inside the mosquito. And something that's really interesting that we see with a lot of these vector-borne diseases, including Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, which is tick-borne, or plague, which is also tick-borne, is that there's an entire infection cycle that affects the vector, not just the host, so we're considering, you know, like you as the host, but the mosquito as a host as well, or the tick or whatever, uh, they actually get kind of sick. And it's interesting, so the parasite itself, it's not that the mosquito is taking up a blood meal and then injecting that same blood meal back into someone. That's not typically how they infect. So there is an entire infection cycle that occurs inside the mosquito for it to get from like its stomach, basically, and it has to pass through the rest of the mos mosquito and get into its salivary glands and then get injected. And there's a, that's an entire field of study, which is really interesting. Now, another vector-borne disease is Chagas. Uh, which is caused by Trypanosoma cruzi, which is a pretty fun word. So it's transmitted uh, via contaminated food or by the triatramine bugs. So these are the kissing bugs. And what they'll do is they'll, they'll crawl onto your face at night. And so you can see in the endemic countries here, so down in Chile there, Brazil, uh, Mexico, Central America, all those areas, and in the Southwest U.S. as well. Uh, so these little bugs will crawl onto you uh, in the middle of the night, and they like to bite, you know, I don't know where it's kind of, the blood vessels are nice and close, so like on your lips, or you can see somebody got bit by their eye here, and it causes that infection and lots of swelling. And the problem with this crazy little parasite here is that it can cause a lot of organ damage. And so you can see we've got a heart up here. Uh, it's got all that kind of fibroticness. It's just really, really sick. Uh, it can just wipe out those organs, which can be really, really dangerous. Now, diarrhea comes up a lot in this class. And so here is another example. This is a parasite that can cause diarrhea. So we've got uh, giardia. Uh, giardiasis is the name of the disease. It's caused by giardia lamblia. And it will cause diarrhea 9 to 15 days. So it can be a week, two weeks after you ate something really bad, uh, which is a really long time. A lot of people think that uh, if you have food poisoning, that happens really, really quickly, you know, within 12 to 24 to 48 hours. But in reality, most gastrointestinal infections actually can take weeks and up to months to actually show. And so you might not even remember what you ate. Uh, but it's interesting, uh, if you have Giardia infection, it's like a greasy diarrhea and lots of gas and lots of vomiting as well. A, a lot of bacterial infections and uh, viral infections that cause diarrhea don't cause vomiting as well, though they can, uh, but Giardia tends to also cause vomiting. And if you don't get any treatment, you can have diarrhea for weeks or even months, which sounds absolutely terrifying. And the problem with Giardia is that it can live inside animal hosts, and so you'd just have to basically kill all the animals if you ever actually wanted to get rid of it, which that's never going to happen. But the most classic way that humans get it is from fecal-oral transmission from contaminated water. And so the way I usually think about it is like if you go out in the woods and you drink water out of a stream, you're going to get Giardia because some deer pooped in it. That's probably not how most people get it, but hey, that's what I think about. Now we've talked about viruses that can be STIs. We've talked about bacteria that can be STIs, and there are, of course, parasites that can be STIs. So trichomoniasis is a disease caused by trichomonas vaginalis. It's a parasite. You can see it here. It's got flagella. It's a little creeper. This is the most common parasite in industrialized countries, so in like the U.S., really, really common as an STD or an STI. 3% uh, of U.S. women are infected with this. Sometimes it's really hard to tell. Uh, if you're a female and you have it, uh, it's a classic discharge with strawberry spots. Basically, your, your genitals just don't 
seem right. There's lots of stuff going on uh, in men, which is, this is why it's a huge problem. There's not usually a lot of symptoms. And so men, you can be transmitting this STI and you would never even know it. And it's really, really bad. I mean, STIs in general are really bad uh, because they can damage your genitals. They can damage uh, any children. Uh, they can cause spontaneous abortions, miscarriages, early labor. And so they're really, really dangerous. And so that's why you get a lot of gynecological visits if you're trying to have a baby or if you're potentially pregnant. Now, the last thing I'm going to talk about is pinworms. Pinworms cause enterobiasis. It's a fecal oral transmission. Uh, I could have talked about a lot of different parasites like this, a lot of different helminths. And so pinworms are a helminth. And so they're just these really big worms. There's all kinds of worms. Uh, there's, you know, the worms that most people think about would be like a tapeworm. Uh, but I threw pinworms on here because it's the most common worm in the developed world. So most people in the developed world or the industrialized world don't get tapeworms, but they do get pinworms, especially kids, because kids are gross and they accidentally get poop in their mouths from their friends. Uh, and they're these little worms and they crawl out of your butt uh, at night and it's really itchy and it's just not a great time. But luckily we get to end on that. So that is the last disease that we will be talking about in this three-part series.